So we were in this uh, study on 1 John. And um, in chapter 4, the first six verses, it kind of reads like a part one and a part two. And I mentioned this last week that the first three verses that we looked at last week is sort of the, the part one, which is the warning to test the spirits. There's a lot of different teachings going on out there, a lot of different um, um, uh, new insights or, or all these things that are, we're, we're being faced with. Um, and John says there are a lot of false, there's false spirits. There, there's false teaching. There are those who are opposed to Christ or in his term, anti-Christ, who are out there and they're very persuasive and very effective in their teaching. So he was giving us that warning. We have to take that and then complete the passage, which is what we're going to be doing today, looking at verses 4, 5, and 6, which is the the comfort, the assurance, uh, the call to rest. If you, if you were, if your conscience is, or if your, if your heart was kind of pricked last week, uh, that's good. Just become aware of the condition that we're in and what we face. But then let's now uh, rest in uh, in what we're seeing uh, in our passage today. So, with that said, let's go ahead and turn to the passage. First uh, John four. Uh, verses uh, 4, 5, and 6. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them. This is the, the, the spirits of the Antichrist. You have overcome them, for he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are from the world, therefore they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let's pray. Uh, So we do ask that by your spirit we may hear, we may um, test, but that we may know uh, your word for us this morning. As we turn to the study here at First John, Holy Spirit, be our teacher, be our helper, be our guide, be our comforter. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If we finished last week and you were thinking, well, how am I supposed to do that? How am I supposed to test the spirits? I'm not a theologian. I didn't go to a fancy theology school. I didn't do all this stuff. How am I supposed to... How am I supposed to do that? That's really the right perspective. That's the right place to be. Um, That's the right uh, condition to be in because uh, John is being very clear that none of us have the ability and power to test the spirits on our own, uh, but need the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, to be helping us along within us. Let's take a a second and and think about this experience, and I hope this uh, makes sense to you, but maybe you have, maybe even this past week, you've been in a situation where there's a group of people talking, maybe it's already happened this morning, group of people talking, and you you come up to them, and you very clearly have no idea what they're talking about. That actually happened to me (laughs) right outside that hallway. I approached the hallway, saw a bunch of people talking. I'm like, what is going on here? And you, you, and you can kind of like, you hear, the, you can very clearly see that they know what they're talking about. And the words that are being spoken between them are understandable and they're agreeing and this and that. But you have very little idea uh, of, of, of what, is, what is happening. Take that picture or that scenario and apply it to our passage. Because really what John is mentioning is that there are really two conversations going on in our lives, in the, in the, in the world that we experience. Two conversations. There's, there's and, and let's really just focus on what John is saying here in chapter 4. There's really just two conversations. There's a conversation concerning the things of God, and then there's a conversation over here concerning the things of the world. Now for John, there's a very clear line between the two of them. And... Um, I, I, I believe that, but I also be, believe that John would argue, and I, you see this in his gospel, that while there is a very clear line between the two, our experience is a little more muddled. And that's even why he's telling us to test the spirits, because there's the ability, there's the likelihood even of us being 
caught up in some of these false teachings. But for him, there's two conversations going on. Conversation over here, uh, people are speaking things of God. And the message that they're saying is of God. The speaker is of God. He's referring to himself as an apostle. If you look real, just real briefly, uh, verse um, 6. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. We need to be careful with that because that can be used um, to kind of bludgeon people. Like if you, were, if you, you would listen to me because uh, uh, I, I am of God, and if you're not listening to me, you're not of God. What, what John is saying there is he's, he's an apostle. All the way back in chapter 1, he's saying, listen, the message I'm delivering you is the message I received from Christ. So listen to us as apostles. There's, a, there's, a, there's the speaker, there's the message, and there's the hearer. John Stott calls this a correspondence of the message. The speaker, the message, the receiver. And we see that in really in this, in this passage, in this book, that this, these are messages from God, of God, for God, for God's people who hear it and receive it. But there's another conversation happening on the other side, and that's what we see in verse 5. They are from the world. Therefore, they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. So there's this other conversation happening here. And John is wanting us to be very careful to understand uh, which conversation we're in, what are the messages we're listening to. Now, a quick aside, bless you, very quick aside, I mentioned this last week, that John is not talking about everything that pertains to the church and every little bit of theology and this and that and the other, because there are some things that we are going to disagree about in the church. Easy ones to take, for example, uh, baptism and end times, right? There are people within the church that have very different beliefs about that, and we're going to hang out in heaven together. And again, they'll see that we're right and all that, but we're going to, we're, these, are, these are differences, right? John's not talking about all the little bit, all the things. He's really talking about the core principles. And again, he's talking about, like in chapter 4, the person of Jesus, that he, God came in the flesh, because there was another teaching going around that he didn't really. That he was just a man, uh, became divine, became God at his baptism, but then ceased being God at his crucifixion. And people were being caught up in that false teaching. And so John is saying we have to test the spirits. So just because you hear something that, that you disagree with, first see, is this a, this is a core doctrinal point or is this something uh, maybe secondary? When we hear a message given to us by God, there's something that rings true in us when we're part of that conversation. We hear it, we test it, we verify it, and then we receive it. Think of this uh, illustration, and if, if it doesn't land, I'm sorry, but think about um, Polar Express, right? Grand Rapids Ties, I believe, right? Author from here. Um, but the movie, Grand Rap uh, the movie Grand Rapids, the movie Polar Express, you, and if you haven't seen it, it's okay. But do you know the scene when they get lost and the train thing is spinning and the one girl hears the bell and she's like, oh, the bell is this way. There was a faint ringing and, and it rang true <laughs> in her. And she's like, this is the way we're supposed to go. She heard it and she followed it, but not everyone did. Picture that as just a, as a small illustration of what's happening. When, when God is speaking to his people, there's something within us that just says, oh, that's true. Now, again, there are some times when we can be unsure, which, again, that's where the testing comes in. That's where referring to Scripture comes in, referring to others whom we know and trust who are mature in the faith. But where John is going to land is really in the power that we have to receive, verify, and live out what we're hearing from God. John uses a lot of us and them language. If you just look again, verses 4, 5, and 6 in this, uh, he's, you are from God and overcome them. We'll talk about the second part of verse 4 in just a moment. Verse, skip into verse, verse 5, they are from the world, therefore they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. Contrasting verse 6, we are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Again, there's that very clear uh, uh, line of demarcation between the two 
between the two groups. Is it always that cut and dry for us? No, and here's why. We, the way we are originally born into this world and in our natural state, we don't naturally hear the message of the gospel and have it ring true in our hearts and our natural fallen state. In our natural fallen state, we hear the message of the gospel and we're like, that's a bunch of garbage. And some of you, uh, I've heard your stories and it's, it's, it's quite profound of that moment where it, it began, began to ring true when you started to hear and understand and receive the gospel. Others of you, and by God's grace, uh, cannot recall, right, a day in which you, when hearing the gospel, you're like, no, that's not true. You've grown and matured in your faith, right, of knowing the gospel and how it applies, but you cannot recall a day in which you're like, that's totally garbage. The principle there, though, is what we really needed to, to, to rest in and, and, and dive in on, and, and that is, it is by God's grace that we are transferred from the conversation of the world to the conversation of the gospel, a conversation of God. I'm going to reference Ephesians 2. If you have a Bible, you can turn there with me or uh, just follow along. I'm just going to stay with my notes here. Paul says this in Ephesians 2. You, church, were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. Okay, So you were once in this conversation of the world. He goes on to say, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that's now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of our body and mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. I mean, my goodness, what a passage. This is Ephesians 2, the first few verses of Ephesians 2, talking about our original condition. Dead in the trespasses and sins, walking in darkness, following the course of the world, following the prince of the power of the air. Very clear reference to the one, the devil who was opposed to Christ, the one who is anti-Christ, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. What Paul's doing in the beginning of Ephesians 2 is really uh, pointing to what, the, what John is speaking here in, in 1 John 4 of these two different conversations. And we really are born into a miserable situation. But the good news comes in the next verse, staying again in Ephesians 2. But God, which I think is one of the most beautiful transitions in Scripture, given this amazing brutal clarity of our natural condition, moving on to verse 4, but God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he's loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, what did he do? He made us alive together with Christ. And then this final statement, by grace you have been saved. What's difficult for the Christian is that when we hear messages of the world, that truth originates in you, that you are your own God, that uh, those who don't validate you uh, are to be uh, cast aside, that your meaning and purpose is all in what you do and what you create and what you sustain. Again, these are all the messages of the world. For those of us who have been called by God, there's still a part of that that we hear that and we're like, hmm, maybe. The, our old nature is still within us. Though the power has been defeated, the presence of that sin nature still is there. And there's still elements that we hear that little ringing of the bell, like in Polar Express. We hear some of that and we're like, oh, maybe my value and worth is tied up to my performance of this, that, and the other. And so what the, 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 the walk of the Christian, the life of the Christian, is constantly going back to, no, I am saved by Grace, my identity is in him and him alone. I am a child of God. He delights in me, not because of what I've done, but because of what Christ has done. That is who I am. I imagine that there's some of you this morning who are really, 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 really tired. And I'm, I'm in that camp too. I'm tired for a variety of reasons. And I'm going to just spend the next couple minutes talking to myself. And you guys have the opportunity to hear me talking to myself. I need to hear this. It's amazing how we can get bogged down by the conversations of the world, believing the things that are um, 
opposed to the teachings of Christ. It's not a salvation thing, and I'll speak to that in, in, in a moment, right? Our salvation is, is sure, it is secure, and there's absolutely nothing that will ever change that. And we heard in the Friday letter from John 10, there's nothing that's going to be, uh, that can pluck us from the hand of God. We are his. So there's a, there's a surety there. But so much discouragement, so much division, so much pain can be caused when we start going back to the other conversation, believing things that are not of Christ. The power, let's, look at, let's, let's now look at verse 4, uh, in the second part of verse 4. He who is in you is greater than than he who is in the world. We're going to spend the rest of our time this morning thinking about the implications of the rest of verse 4. Uh, I would um, strongly encourage you to memorize that phrase and just have that be your ongoing practice. Uh, and again, I'm speaking to myself. He who is, great, is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Who are the he's? The beginning of the end of chapter 3 and in here to chapter 4, the he who is in you is the anointing of the Holy Spirit. God, the, the, the third person of the Trinity residing in you. He is the one who has brought us from the darkness of our trespasses, the death, the death of our sins, brought us into this new life. It is the work of the Spirit. He who is in you is greater than the second he the one in the world. And this is Satan. This is devil. This is the devil. This is also the, um, the spirit of the age, the darkness of the age and the times, all the death, the destruction, the disease, the division, all of those things uh, under the uh, joy of the one who is opposed to Christ and all things that are good. That is a great power, and it's sort of um, alluded to here in verse 4. He who is in you is greater than he who is also great who is in the world. Because the spirit of the Antichrist, the spirit of the age, is very persuasive, very sneaky. Um, notice, if you think back again to the context of 1 John 4, the false teaching wasn't, hey, God doesn't exist. No, the false teaching was, God does exist, and Jesus is a very um, important person, but he wasn't God. It was, it was taking a truth, but then twisting it a little bit. And I've just found in my own life, my own experience, that is how Satan works so well. Taking a truth and twisting it just a little bit. I remember when I was a kid, uh, we'd go to the lake. This is down in Tennessee, and there was this. We had this little raft that we'd go fishing on, and sorry, fishing. <clears throat> I start thinking of Tennessee, and all my words just kind of just jumbled together. But we we were out on the little the little lake, and we were on this raft, and um, we had a little motor on the back of it, and I uh, I would. I was out there with my dad, and he would have me try to go to a certain fishing, fish, fishing spot, and I would turn the, uh, <laughs> the engine just a little bit, and it would, it would just be a little bit, but by the time we got to the actual fishing hole, we'd be like three, three down from it. It was this whole other thing, and it was like just a little bit off. If you continue on that little bit off, it's going to be very much off. And I know there are other uh, illustrations that are probably far less rednecky to use than that one, but I just decided to do that one. I will re resume now my normal, less southern accent, too. But it's the, the spirit who is opposed to us does like to use just little things to get us discouraged, to get us uh, off the path that he's called us for. He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. John is referring to us as the dear children. And again, that's not a diminutive term. That's not an insulting term. But he, what he's doing is first referring to himself again as their father in the faith. But he's reminding them that they are children of God. He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. And so again, here is the assurance of our faith from John 10. And again, I'm just going to read the passage. Jesus speaking this. The sheep hear my voice. 
Again, there's the message of the truth of the gospel and, and us as his sheep. We hear his voice and we respond to it. The bells start going off and we're like, yes, that's true. That's our shepherd. I know them, Jesus says, and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. Let me just stop again and say, if, if huh, I'm talking to myself, but again, I think there are others who need to hear this. Listen to the voice of our shepherd. Hear it because he knows you. He calls you to follow him. Our shepherd gives us eternal life and we will never perish. Again, that doesn't mean that we'll never, we'll never be bound permanently by death. I was at a funeral yesterday. Death happens and it is to be hated Jesus hated it, but he's come to destroy it. The perishing that he's talking about is eternal, and no one will snatch us out of his hand, regardless of whatever temporary false teaching we may follow. There is a surety of salvation that is true in Christ. If the Spirit awakens us to our need of him and what has been accomplished in Christ, that is a permanent surety of faith, a, a permanent presence of the hope of Christ. My Father, he con concludes, has given them to me. And he's greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I've found this to be incredibly um, helpful for me personally, just knowing the surety of my faith um, and, and the, 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 the eternal security that I have. But I also know this for others whom I love. I know that there's been a profession of faith, and yet, for whatever reason, there has been a swerving. There has been a, a, a falling away, and it is heartbreaking to see. But where I go back to is this promise from Jesus in John 10 that his ways are higher, and ultimately, they will not be snatched from his hand. Let me conclude with this. I want you to think about where your biggest source of struggle or discouragement or whatever it may be in the moment. And I want you to put it at the end of the phrase of chapter 4. So for example, he who is in you, if he's greater than he who is in the world, that has all kinds of applications for us. He who is in you is greater than your shame. He who is in you is greater than your shame that you carry with you. He who is in you is greater than your anger that you struggle with. He who is in you is greater than your broken relationships, because we've all got them. The broken relationships in our lives that cause us pain and discouragement, all these things. He who is in us is greater than that. He who is, greater, who, he who is in you is greater than your lust, addictions, Besetting sins. He who is in you is greater than your greed. He who is in you is greater than your doubt, your disbelief. He who is in you is greater than your family drama, the pain caused by that. He who is in you is greater than the ugliness of your heart. But get this. He who is in you is greater also than your self-righteousness. He who is in you is greater than your feeling of superiority. He who is in you is greater than your feeling of sense of, of I need to earn my salvation. I need to do these things so that Christ will accept me. He is greater than that. If he is greater than he who is in the world, he is greater than all the things that the world, and by that, the world, Satan, our flesh, tries to get us to believe other than the gospel of Christ. The remedy to this, believing the conversation of the world, is not to try harder, is not to believe harder or perform better, but really the remedy is to rest more deeply in the presence of the one who was given to us. You can read John 3, the, 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 the new birth, 
You can get into John 14. I have a whole list of them abroad. You, uh, John 14 as our helper who will teach us all things and bring to mind the teachings of Christ. Rest more fully in that. John 15, uh, that, 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 that when the helper comes, he will bear witness. He actually sends us out, bear witnessing to the truth of Christ. John 16, that when the Spirit is within us, he's, he will convict sin, um, leading us into repentance. So again, this is not a call to, to just do better and try harder or perform better, but it's to rest more deeply, to grow in dependence. That's not a call to be passive, but to actively grow in your dependence upon Christ. We said this, how do you grow in your faith? You grow by becoming more dependent upon him who's doing the good work in your life. Actualizing faith. What's the first step to do that? Well, I would just say this, begin by prayer. Spend time with him. Be still. Go walk in the woods. At one point, this is, if anyone had seen me, I don't know, they might have had some questions, but at one point on my hike yesterday, I walked up to one of these ancient trees and I just put my hand on it. And just the, the feeling of the, 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 the solidness of that tree uh, was something so uh, comforting in me, to feel something that just doesn't bend. <laughs> And I just think that's another picture of of what it's like as we rest in God's love for us, the presence of the Spirit within us. There is a surety there. I'm going to close by by reading something that was read in the uh, funeral yesterday. Uh, Dan Millward, he's a church planter in Detroit. His daughter passed away tragically in a car accident. And uh, the service was yesterday. And um, this passage was read. And as I heard it read, of course, we're all just undone. I'm going to try to not, um, um, try, I'm going to try to hold it together, but if I cry, it's okay. But listen to this passage that was read at this, at this um, woman's funeral and, and also how it applies to our, our condition even now and, so, and what we've been talking about in 1 John 4. I'll close with this, but this is uh, 2 Corinthians 4, beginning at verse 7. <clears throat> We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not us. Right? If you think that it's up to you to do all the testing of the spirits on your own, you don't have the power to do that. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show the surpassing power that belongs to God and not us. We are afflicted in every way, false teachings or whatever they may be. We're afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. What I love to preach on that sometime. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may also, may also be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. Since we have the same spirit of faith, so here again we're getting to the Holy Spirit, the same spirit of faith, according to what's been written, I believe and so I spoke. We also believe and so we also speak. So again, here again, how that applies to 1 John 4, there's the speaking of the truth, there's the hearing of the truth, receiving of the truth, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. Three more verses. So we do not lose heart. Though the outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light, momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Let's pray.
Thank you. Father and Son who sent the Spirit that proceeds from you. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for abiding in us, residing in us. Help us to believe that you who are residing, who is residing in us, are greater than the the sins of the world, the brokenness of the world, the sins of our own flesh. Help us to live out our lives the rest of this day, the rest of the week, month, year, resting in the surety of that presence of your Spirit, knowing at all times that he who is in us is greater than he who is in the world. Show us where we're believing the conversations of the world. Lead us to repentance and lead us into a deeper rest in who you are and the truth that you provide for us in Christ. We pray this in his name.